Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. We had a great guest at Mind Speak over the weekend, Simea Hassan Athmani, who's the CEO of National Oil Company, and I am grateful to her for a very engaging, wide ranging, and outstanding ex exposition on oil and gas, as I thought it would be when I met with her earlier in the week. Her presentation, we're, we're in the edit suite with the video, but her presentation as shown at MindSpeak uh, is on the front page of the website and is the second or third item on rich wrap-ups and have a look at it because she's unpicked and unpacked a lot of things in that presentation. She said many things and uh, a couple that I was, one thing which I really liked was about how you have to be authentic um, and uh, she was very witty as well. National Oil tweeted Kenya's oil is sweet has low sulfur, but very waxy and low flow rate. Um, very interesting uh, uh, mind speaking, I must say, and I'm so glad she came and gave us such a broad view. And her philosophy was fascinating. Macro thoughts, I've gone back to Paul Virilio. Wealth is the hidden side of speed, and speed the hidden side of wealth. Home thoughts, speed now illuminates reality, whereas light once gave objects of the world their shape. And one of my favorites is how images contaminate us like viruses. It makes me think of uh, uh, Daesh. Um, field of vision is comparable for me to the terrain of an archeological dig to see is to be on guard, to wait for what emerges from the background, without any name, without any particular interest. What was silent will speak, what is closed will open, will take on a voice. It's a really powerful thing, I must say, made a big impression on me. I found this infographic from AFP highlighting Africa's October elections. Um, Tanzania, Ivory Coast, Brazzaville, where there's a referendum. The FT um, has an article about this. The result is a real struggle for the heart and soul of Africa's future, according to Christopher Fomunyo. Few leaders appear to be paying attention to President Obama, who said in July, during an African tour, that the continent's democratic progress was at risk from leaders who tried to change the rules to cling to power. On the one hand, you have autocrats and retrograde forces trying to push the continent back, or keep it, keep it in the yoke of autocratic practices and rule, he said. On the other hand, you have the younger generation that have embraced democracy and democratic principles and practices, and who want to see their countries governed differently. Philip Rentjens, a Central Africa expert at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, said the issue went much further than human rights. If you cannot replace someone through the ballot box, then the only option is violence, and that doesn't result in long-term stability. Burundi is considered the most egregious current example of this. It is still suffering the violent consequences of President Pierre Kurenzinza's decision this year to persuade his country's courts to allow him to run for a third term. Decision triggered an attempted coup. Mr. Kurenzinza defeated it and was re-elected in July. Scores of people have died in related violence that is yet to end. Analysts expect Mr. Sassin Wesso, who has ruled for all but five years since 1979, Mr. Kagame in Rwanda and Mr. Kurenzinza in Burundi to remain in power for some years, but argue that Mr. Kabila's chances of success are slimmer due to a more developed political opposition and active civil society. Even if they all succeed in the short term, the long-term prognosis is uncertain. Mr. Tabara says, and this is something that uh, Taleb has been saying, the big elephant in the room is that we're going to have to move on at some point. And the longer these people hang around, the harder it is to see what that change will look like. I touched on this in 2014 when I took Wagadougou as my 
example and a signal to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. And I said, what's clear, this is Magadugu, and I think it applies across the continent, is a very young, very informed, very connected African youth demographic, which many characterize as a demographic dividend, but which for beautiful blaze turned into a demographic terminator, is set to alter the existing equilibrium between the rulers and the subjects. And I was saying then a rebalancing has begun. But some places it's begun, others it's in reverse. Um, and I said, as we look around the world today, we can see a battle for the street, from the streets of Bujumbura to the streets of Baltimore. And I went back to quote Virilio, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form, not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, machine of attack, in other words, a producer of speed. And I was saying, you know, what we need to ask ourselves, how many people can an incumbent shoot stone cold, cold dead in such a situation? 100, 1,000, 10,000. I said, this is another point. There is a threshold beyond which the incumbent cannot go. Where that threshold lies will be discovered in the throes of the event. The Economist tweeted, Congo Brazzaville is not a monarchy, but it is increasingly looking like one. Um, in Tanzania, I think it looks like the CCM is going to win this all ends up from the early high frequency data. A uh, fellow saying, I voted for uh, President Magufuli because I believe he will keep his promises. He's a man of integrity. Let me put up a photograph I took of Dar es Salaam at night from the eighth floor of the Hyatt. Hillary Clinton, I like this photograph, a uh, series of photographs taken of her at uh, the House Select Committee hearing last week. And then I came across this article in the Independent, which makes uh, the point, uh, so of course, there is a strong case against Clinton's action. Libya, but they relate to a support for the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011 and not the death of Christopher Stevens in 2012. There is no doubt that she played a crucial role along with President Obama's advisers, Samantha Power and Susan Rice, in the decision by the US to intervene on the side of anti-Gaddafi rebels. Although France and the UK played a more public role, the US termed its strategy as leading from behind, Clinton was proud of her action, proclaiming in October 2011, after the killing of Gaddafi, we came, we saw, he died. She said during the recent Democratic presidential candidates debate that what she did in Libya was smart power at its best. In April 2013, Seymour Hersh published in the London Review of Books an account of what CIA calls a rat line, which was created in early 2012 to funnel weapons and ammunition from Libya via southern Turkey and across the Syrian border to the opposition. This was a result of an agreement between the US, Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar to equip the armed Syrian rebels. And much of this weaponry ended up with jihadis affiliated to Al-Qaeda. Hirsch says that an account of what happened in the setting up of the rat line is in a highly classified, unpublished section of the Senate Intelligence Committee's report into the death of Mr. Stevens in Benghazi, which was issued in January 2013. So that was a legitimate, that's the legitimate question. I don't think you can point the finger and blame her per se for um, Stevens' death. And, uh, however, that story is correct, but the point is that Hillary Clinton won the political argument uh, hands down and all ends up um, in that 11 hours when she was given free reign to express herself and when she was very, very subtle in how she did that. The Law and Justice Party won 39.1% of the vote and a projected 242 seats in the 460 member Lerd chamber, this is the first time that a single group will command a majority since the introduction of democracy in Poland in 1989. Uh, this photograph of Shinzo Abe, um, it's a very shiny suit. Let's go on to the currency markets. Euro got up to 110.50, it now is at 110.28 dollar index, 97.04. 
Japanese yen, 12106 the pound is at 153.45. The Aussie, which has been on the mend of late, 0.7253. India rupee 65, South Korean 11133, Rial 388.05, Egyptian pound 801.22, the Rand 13.60. The dollar index, let me put up a three month chart, looks toppy now to me. Euro dollar. Uh, from this sort of level of 110.28, I think we can expect a small rebound. Let's move on to the commodity markets. Gl uh, gold is last trading at uh, 11.65. Um, I think 11.55 remains key support, and I think we're going back to around 12.25. Look for 12.25 with a stop at 10.45 maybe. Goldman Sachs is saying oil prices can go sharply lower as product inventory is near maximum capacity. Crude oil prices could drop sharply lower as refined product storage sites come close to maximum capacity, further adding to a glut that has already seen crude prices fall by more than half since June 2014, Goldman said. Distillate storage utilization in the US and Europe is nearing historically high levels, following near record refinery utilization only modest demand growth, especially relative to gasoline and increased imports from the east on refinery expansion and Chinese exports, Goldman said. This raises the spectre of 1998 um, and 2009 when distillate storage had capacity pushing runs and crude oil prices sharply lower. Put up a chart that Holger's put up and uh, now always remained a bear. I think we haven't seen the bottom yet, so this might well be the rollover moment. Let's move on to Africa. Ivory Coast votes in its first post-war presidential poll. Voting began in the Ivory Coast on Sunday. Election likely to give President Alassane Ouattara a second term. In my opinion, the president is a shoo-in. Let me put up a couple of photographs. One of a street in Abidjan's Riviera district at dusk and another of a worker cleaning a swimming pool at the Hotel Ivoire. Apparently it's had a facelift and room starting at more than $250 a night are regularly purely booked. South Africa's President Zuma has frozen the 2016 proposed university fee increase. Um, so now uh, fees will stay the same. They were previously proposing 11.5% year on year. Um, arguing the need for higher fees to keep up standards, but uh, it's, you know he's back down pretty quickly. He blinked first, especially when they were trying to break down the fence outside his office. Let me put up a photograph of protesters chanting slogans as they burn portal loos during a protest over planned increases in tuition fees outside the Union Building in Pretoria. South African all share, interestingly, is at a five-month high. It's now up 9.1% year-to-date. Dollar Rand 13.60, I think that can go back towards the 13 level. Egyptian Pound 801.22, Egyptian EGX 30 down 14.27% year-to-date. Nigerian all share down 13.4% year-to-date. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index down 12.1% year-to-date. Coming to Kenya, the National Treasury has been back to raise fresh commercial debt of up to $1.5 billion by December under an agreement reached with the IMF. The government is committed to borrow through a sukuk in the coming months despite absence of enabling legal framework to settle the recently contracted syndicated domestic debt. Treasury Secretary Ro Titch recently disclosed that part of the 229 billion shillings initially intended to be borrowed domestically would now be sourced internationally where rates are still low. I think we're still way below what you can say is unsustainable. There is no cause for alarm in our debt levels, especially when it is going into development and not for current expenditure. Uh, currently, public debt stands at 2.9 trillion or nearly 52% of the GDP. My piece over the weekend, and there was a lot of announcements that have come subsequently, was this Euro bond and investor relations. It says you do not have to be an accomplished rocket scientist or even an economist to know that where investors were once keen to surf the Africa rising wave, they have, for the better part of this year, been looking to get off their surfboards. 
We see this in an extraordinary route of African currencies. Latest year to date, data from Bloomberg shows only two currencies have improved in Africa versus the dollar this year. Incredibly, those two currencies were the Somali shilling, which is up 13.02%, and the Gambian Delassi, up 9.32%. The Kenya shilling is minus 11.29% to date, outperforming the South African rand, which is minus 13.78%. Tanzanian shilling minus 20.5, Uganda shilling minus 23.56, and the Kwacha, Zambian Kwacha, which is the worst performing currency in the world, minus 47.36%. President uh, Edgar Lungus led his country in prayer rallies last week to resurrect the Kwacha. Prayer rallies are what traders call a Hail Mary pass. These losses in our currencies are signaling that instead of money pouring into Africa, it's been pouring out in order to staunch the bleeding central banks of hiked rates. The euro bond markets, which were only recently a deep pool of liquidity, have become shark infested. When Zambia first sold bonds in international markets in 2012, the country got so much demand, it could have issued 16 times the $750 million it raised. And its all-in rate was 5.63%. In July 2015, Zambia only got twice as many bids uh, for the $1.25 billion on sale and was compelled to accept an interest rate of 9.38%. Ghana this month became only the fourth country uh, in the past decade to issue Eurobond yields above 10%. That was only after the World Bank guaranteed 40% of the issue. Average sub-Saharan African dollar yields have soared by almost 150 basis points to 7.21% between the end of April and October the 22nd. I said we could call this a double whammy. Our currencies are worth less. The cost to borrow has exploded off the charts. Kenya has seen its euro bond dollar yields climb to over 8% from about 6% in the past six months. And an enormous hullabaloo has kicked off in traditional and on social media about where the proceeds of this euro bond side, what deductions were made against this 2.75 billion dollar cash raise and exactly what is being done with the interest. As you can see from the first two paragraphs, Africa is living in a precarious financial moment. Those who do not get it end up holding prayer rallies like President Nungu. Public relations or rallying hashtag armies is simply not going to cut it. In fact, this type of rebuttal is foul naïf and seriously counterproductive. We have two audiences we have to engage with, and the engagement is called investor relations, and it's definitely not public relations. When you sell $2.75 billion worth of bonds to international investors, you are essentially ceding sovereignty over the pricing of your credit to the buyers. They are pricing us on a real-time and continuous basis. Therefore, the first audience we have to engage with are those who are holding our bonds. If they don't like what they're hearing, or are hearing nothing at all, we seem to have entered a black hole in this regard. They're going to sell our bonds and ask questions later. Point one is we need to start engaging with these folks, and it requires serious, sophisticated, and transparent investor relations messages. And the second audience is Wanjiku. I received this tweet over the weekend from Zamzam. Perhaps the situation is inexplicable, therefore explaining the lack of an explanation. I believe it is explicable, and we just have to start explaining. Interesting piece in Africa Confidential about Britain's Africa's continental shift. Talking, saying Africa relations have been peppered in recent years with near misses, faux pas, and a general lack of policy, but this may be changing. Major conferences on migration next month in Malta, climate change in Paris, British diplomats are trying hard to get agreements in advance with African delegations. Britain has extracted itself from its declaration of 2013 that it would only have essential contacts with President Uhuru Kenyatta. Then under indictment by the ICC, this reversal was due to some nimble diplomacy by Christian Turner, Britain's High Commissioner in Nairobi. Now British High Prime Minister David Cameron is due in Kenya on a state visit next year. Carbacid reported full year profit before tax declined 2.81%, but because the tax charge was effectively 32% of PBT versus 18% of 
PBT last time round, EPS fell 19.69% to 1.55. They hiked the dividend to 133.33%. Kenya shilling back around the 102.10 level, high interest rates obviously supporting the Nairobi all share. Down 14.33% year to date, but at an 11 day high. NSE 20, similarly at an 11 day high, but down 22.68% year to date. Once again, thank you for stopping by. Oh, point, uh, I'm away tomorrow until the weekend. I'm in Seychelles with the Afrex in Bank. So you will excuse me, but I will update Rich Randolph's, but not be able to do the podcast, I'm afraid. Thank you.